Hey Chris. Yeah. What percentage of people do you think are gonna use the A7S III for photography? Oh, I don't know, like what, two, three percent if that. Okay, so you get to use the camera to take pictures for two to three percent of the day and I'm gonna keep it for the rest. No, but I have to do sample get. No, it's a photographer's dream camera. They'll be buying it in droves. Welcome back, Deep Review TV viewers. Chris Nichols here, and uh, my camera bag is empty right now because Jordan has stolen the Sony A7S III from me. Yes, that is what we're looking at today, a very highly anticipated camera. It's been a long time coming. Now, I also wanna say that the Sony A7S III is pre-production, but this is gonna be quite a comprehensive preview. We're gonna talk about handling, menu systems, a little bit of photos, but I really know what you guys wanna see, a lot of video. So as usual, I like to always talk about handling. So I got the A7S III here in my hands, and let's just kind of talk about how it feels. Now, first off, you're gonna find the body is actually very similar, very familiar, especially if you're coming from an A7R4 or an A9 Mark II. It is fully weather sealed. The top dials, buttons and controls, and the joystick on the back are also very similar. However, I, oh, sorry, I would drop the camera if I do that. But the last point I want to go with before we leave is it has no tally lamp and that's actually really annoying. You might think that's more of a Jordan thing, but really as the presenter, it's super helpful to me to be able to see, oh, the camera's rolling and there's little LED lights. I can see them right beside the lens and unfortunately they don't turn on. So maybe that's something that'll change when it comes to production cam. That's a good photo. That shutter is, by the way, incredibly quiet, Jordan, like very well dampened. It's almost as if I don't feel anything when I push the shutter. Jordan, can I please have the camera for this part to explain? No? All right, fine. Okay, fine. So first thing that we love about this, it is a fully articulating screen on the back, 1.44 million dot LCD. Look at that. I can rotate towards you guys for vlogging, rotate it back for me. Of course, Jordan loves this. I actually don't mind it for photography either. Great implementation. Now it is touch screen and of course Sony's have always been touch screen for a long time, but only in terms of choosing your autofocusing point. But now I can touch there on my menu and choose my menu selections. Just Radical, it's awesome, it's incredible. The other thing I do now is the function button. We've been begging for this for a long time. Hit the function button, there's my quick tiles on the bottom, and now I can touch them and I can make changes to the quick tiles right away. The only thing that would make this even better is if I had like live touch of aperture shutter and ISO, a la, like, like what a Canon EOS R does, but it's a fantastic improvement. Okay, so the second huge change that we want to talk about in terms of handling on the Sony a7S III, it is the EVF. So you now have a 9.44 million dot EVF, 0.9 magnification. These are huge specs, way higher than anything else on the market in this class of camera. And when I bring it up to my eye, I mean, it's very good. I would even go so far as to say right now, it looks like there's nothing in between my eye and reality. It's, it's quite stunning. But, uh, you know, in truth, okay. So I have played with it, it is stunning. I mean, it's excellent magnification. We've used a lot of the 5.76 million dot EVFs that you'd find on the, you know, the S1s, for example, at Panasonic, and they're very good. And moving up this high in resolution, I honestly don't see that much difference. It was already really good. Now you do have some quality options that you can change for the EVF. The first one I'm gonna talk about is, of course, the refresh rate. You can go up to 120 frames per second in the viewfinder, which is very contemporary with a lot of the high-end full-frame cameras right now, and that's excellent. And most importantly, I'm not seeing any sort of resolution drop going from the lower frame rate to 120 frames per second, and I would normally expect to see it get softer. So that's a big plus. One thing that does affect the sharpness, though, in a fairly big way is the EVF quality setting. Now, you can go from normal to high, and we did notice quite a difference in how sharp that EVF was going to high quality. I would leave it there, honestly. Although I still feel the viewfinder is not as sharp as when you're looking at your photos in playback. Now we've got a big number three as far as handling changes go. We have a radically new menu system for the A7S III, which I'm sure we will see going forward on all the Sony cameras from here on out. Now, you gotta understand, we have been complaining about Sony menus since the inception of the Sony NEX mirrorless system. Even though they've tried to tweak things and change things over the years, it has largely been seen as a confusing, 
overly complex and hard to navigate menu system. Now we have a very simple vertical interface, three separate pages. It's all touch screen, which makes it much easier to just scroll up or down through the pages. Now, after all of that, we only have a couple minor quibbles with this new menu system. Now, first off, you can only show seven options in that page. So if you've got a full page, just keep in mind, you might want to scroll up and down to make sure you're not missing any features in there. The other thing I would say is, although Sony has worked very hard to make things more simple, there are still some strange wording things like uh, emph dis der rec, uh, which is uh, a really useful feature. It actually shows the whole frame with a red outline when you're rolling. Yeah some translation still required. You can actually see we've got dual card slots in here. Now they look a lot like SD ports, but they're not. They're actually for a brand new card type called CF Express Type A. Now, CF Express Type A's look a lot like SD's. They do have a slightly different form factor. However, they both fit either SD or CF Express A into the same slots. And this camera's backwards compatible. There's very few situations where you might want to use the CF Express A to get all the features, but those will unlock the full potential of the camera's abilities. Now, on the other side of the camera here, full size HDMI port, fantastic. Jordan's going to love that. You also have a USB-C port right below it. This will support a lot of the PD chargers so you can get fast charging right in camera. Now the A7S III does have the latest autofocusing capabilities of all their full frame mirrorless cameras, which means you get their excellent machine learning based eye detect, real time tracking, face detect, detecting animals and animals eyes. I mean, it really does work very well. So of course I'm happy to see this come over to this camera as well. All right, I know you don't want to hear me talk anymore. You want to get to Jordan's part, but before he gets on camera, I do want to say one last thing. This camera has kept us friends because as we're switching back and forth cameras, we now have a new menu function where we can set what the camera retains and what it forgets when you go from video mode to photography mode. And this is amazing because when I get the camera, it's not in S-Log3 looking flat as hell. And when Jordan gets the camera, it's not at 2,000th of a second shutter speed. We're very happy because of that, but okay, okay. Jordan's turn, let's switch over. All right, finally time to talk about video. It's Jordan here, and a few weeks ago I made a video talking about the A7S III and what I wanted from it, and they did most of it, so I should be absolutely overjoyed, right? I, I mostly am, but there's some stuff that annoys me because that's just my disposition. So just like I asked for, we've got a 12 megapixel sensor in here, and that does give you a few really nice advantages. For starters, it's a fast readout on this. Now, it's not a stacked CMOS sensor, which would have been amazing, but it is still twice as fast. Sony's saying it's scanning, and you can see the rolling shutter is fairly minimal on this, which is good. So there's two main benefits to the lower pixel count on this. First one is you are getting outstanding low light performance. The A7S II at extremely high ISOs was the best out there, and this looks just as good, if not even better. The other really great thing about that low resolution sensor is it's gonna give you some awesome high frame rate recording options. You can shoot 4K 60, no crop, just shoot it like any other mode out there. But you also get 4K 120. There is a small crop when you use that, but it's very manageable. As well, at 1080, you're getting up to 240 frames per second. And unlike a lot of Sony cameras, the 1080 quality is actually quite good on that. Now you can record 4K 120 with sound in its standard mode. That's going to be great if you want to do speed ramping or if you're doing documentary work. Watch out! But then you can also switch it to S and Q, which will up the data rate. So that means you're not going to have motion compression issues with it. It won't record sound but you're gonna get higher quality. So the picture profiles that'll be available is something I was very curious about. And you've got the standard suite of Sony ones, Cine 1, Cine 2, which I like. You've got S-Log2 and S-Log3, as well as HLG recording with a few different flavors of it. Now, before I would always say stick to the Cine modes or S-Log2, because most of those 8-bit cameras, as soon as you went past that, you'd see a lot of weird banding, you'd see your skin tones fall apart, but this is a 10-bit camera now, so S-Log3 is very usable. Sony's saying 15 stops of dynamic range. I mean, I don't think it's 15 usable stops of dynamic range, but you are certainly going to find that you have much more gradable files coming out of this. If you need quick playback and display, HLG is there as well for you, but honestly, if you're buying this camera, you probably want to grade the video so I think you'll be using S-Log3 a lot. All right, it's time for everybody's favorite part. Let's talk about compression on these cameras. I know it might sound dry, but it's very important. So Sony's implementing a new series of codecs with this. I really love they have something called XAVC HS, and what this is doing, it's an H.265 compression, so very efficient, and you can record 10-bit 422, 
at 100 megabits per second at 24 frames per second. Very small efficient file sizes on it. Now it will be very hard on your computer to edit. That's the trade-off with high compression. You've got Sony's older XAVC-S standards are there as well, but you also get XAVC-I from the big pro cameras. Now this is all I compression, so the files are gonna be huge on this. The nice thing though is it's quite easy on your editing suite when you're working with those. So if you find your computer struggling with those 100 megabit files, maybe try using those 600 megabit files. Might actually be more manageable. So the original A7S was a hugely game-changing camera. I actually used it on a short film called Metanoia. We got amazing stuff in the sky that we couldn't have gotten with any other camera. Shoot in extreme low light, shooting with just flashlights, lighting stuff. It was pretty amazing. The downside is we had to throw away like half the shots that we used the A7S because the rolling shutter was so bad it became incredibly distracting with jello -y lines all over the place. Sony's saying that this reads out two times as fast as that camera, uh, which sounds great, but that puts it roughly competitive with a lot of the other competition out there. So Sony still has an IBIS system in this, but now it's been complemented by their new Active Steady Shot. Basically what it's doing, it's using the gyro information from within the camera and shifting around its little 4K portion of the sensor that it's using. Now that does mean you get a mild crop with it. It's a 1.13 times crop. But the advantage is you do definitely get some smoother video on that. And you can see right now, I mean, Chris is a master videographer and it's silky smooth. I mean, you can't expect results like this yourself, but it gives you, you know, a benchmark that you can shoot for. What I will say, mild crop, slight loss in quality, but for a lot of shots, it's gonna be worth turning on that active steady shot. It looks like we're on a raging ocean. Let's talk a little bit about raw video on this camera. Now you're not gonna be getting internal raw like you are with the Canon R5 or some of the Blackmagic cameras out there. However, out of that beautiful full HDMI port that I've been asking for, you will be able to put this into external recorders and get 16-bit raw output out of it. And it's just slightly more than a cinema 4K image. Now, the great thing about that is the file sizes are gonna be quite manageable. You're not gonna have to worry about enormous 8K or 6K video files, but you're still gonna get excellent dynamic range. I'm hoping we see some announcements from Atomos the same day this camera is announced. We'll see what happens there, but I'm looking forward to playing with the raw files once we get a full production camera. If you've been paying attention to my career, you know I'm regarded as a master parkourist. Is that how it's pronounced? I don't want to demonstrate that right now, so I'm going to make Chris uh, walk around with the camera. But you can see Sony's real-time video autofocus tracking does a wonderful job. Throughout the entire day, I've had no hiccups with it, and even doing extreme low light tests, occasionally it'll waver a bit, but it's still very consistent. My issue with this is actually the interface for it. You do have to touch on your subject to initiate tracking, and that means if you're using that gorgeous Sony electronic viewfinder, you have to take your eye off the viewfinder, poke on the back of the screen, and then put your eye back up to the electronic viewfinder, which will shake the hell out of the camera when you're changing your focus point. It's not ideal. I'd love a way to just use the AF on button to initiate video autofocus tracking, but hey, be a firmware update. Not that difficult. Chris, come back. Where are you going? So I've talked about how I like this back LCD panel, but there's a couple issues. So first off, uh, if I'm vlog style like I'm doing right now, I can't see anything because there's cords in front of it. And the door for the ports only goes open 90 degrees. It doesn't go past that. It's not flexible. So I'm shooting Jordan here and I'm trying to get low angle shots in the screen. I can't tuck it underneath the headphone and mic jack because then it hits that door and it just bumps against it. So that's an unfortunate problem. Okay, this is a judgment-free zone. We've all been there when you frame up a shot, looks great, you hit record and you're like, oh, f me, this is completely out of focus. And when that happened, Sony had a feature that was quite useful. It would actually let you punch in and check focus while the camera was recording, which is actually quite rare. Problem was, when it punched in to check focus, the image quality was actually pretty garbage in those situations. Really tough to tell if you were in focus or not, which is the whole point of the feature. With the A7S III, they've really improved that. It's a nice sharp image when you jump in. Reminds me of a Fuji camera. So you really can check that focus. Let's say you've got an interview subject who's a leaner. Those people are the worst when they're trying to make a point. In that situation, the A7S III has you covered. All right, let's talk about how the A7S III compares to some of its strongest competitors, starting with the Canon R5. We have had no issues with overheating with the Sony A7S III, which has been a real problem with the R5. As well, if you're interested in doing RAW recording, yes, the Canon's gonna get you 8K RAW, but that is uncompressed 8K RAW 
enormous file sizes, I think I'd much rather have Sony's nice 4K 16-bit RAW to an external recorder would be a better option. And audio is very important to me. I love that Sony still gives you an XLR adapter option, which Canon does not. And that Sony version is gonna be available for up to four tracks of audio, which is a pretty cool feature. But we have to remember the R5 does give you incredibly sharp 8K video and it's HQ 4K that super sampled from 8 is still sharper than what the S3 is gonna give you. As well, I would say that the Canon R5 is a better photo camera. If you wanna do 50-50 split, it's a better hybrid device. All right, let's see how the Sony compares to my boy, the Panasonic S1H. Now, the Sony does have some real advantages again. You're getting less rolling shutter when you're recording in full frame 4K with the Sony. On top of that, you've got the option for 4K 60 without having to punch into a Super 35 area, and the Sony throws in 4K 120. It's there if you want it. And of course, it has much better autofocus than Panasonic's wobbly DFD system. If you require autofocus, the Sony's just a better buy. But then the Panasonic comes back with some really cool professional features. You are getting a sharper 24 megapixel readout for video, and of course your stills are gonna be quite a bit sharper as well. On top of that, you've got a lot of really useful assist tools like waveforms, vector scopes. I wish Sony had chosen to include those in this camera. You've got a better tilting flip screen design on the back of the camera and a whole bunch of unconventional but really useful tools for pros like being able to shoot anamorphic or academy ratio or program in custom LUTs, all stuff you'd see on high-end cinema cameras that the Sony is not gonna offer you. So we've been out here shooting with the a7S III all day and it's just been very reliable and a pleasure to shoot with. The autofocus has been working great. Shot the whole thing handheld and it does look fairly stable. And our battery is still at 30% after the whole day. We've had no overheat warnings. I mean, that's what I really love about the Sony. It seems like a camera that's designed for using it day in, day out and getting the job done. Now it comes out the same year as Canon's R5, which brings a lot to the table. I think 8K is gonna give people some amazing creative options and I love them pushing things forward but on the same token Sony is making a camera that you don't have to worry about those overheat warnings it's going to be a very consistent practical tool and I think it's kind of funny it feels like Sony and Canon have kind of switched place in the video world that way but hopefully you found this useful don't forget this is just a preview we'll have a lot of tests coming up very soon as well you can hop on dpreview.com you can take a look at a bunch of Chris's sample photos as well as the other team from Seattle. Don't forget, follow us on Instagram, follow us on Twitter. Chris and I are constantly posting on there and we'll be back very soon with an A7S 3 review.